All right, so what we talked about last time, we got into uh, static failure criteria. We, we saw our very first one of those uh, that is sometimes called the Tresca criteria. It's also known as the maximum shear stress criteria. Um, and today, the, the criteria we're going to look at is called the distortion energy criteria. Distortion energy takes uh, a pretty good bit more analysis to kind of derive and come up with what this theory is and, and sort of mathematically how to deal with it. Um, so what I've done is I've actually posted all of the notes, actually not quite all, I'm going to do an example problem at the end, and those are not included in the notes that I have posted on Moodle. But this derivation that I'm going to run through right here has the notes posted on Moodle, so you don't have to feel like you have to get every single uh, pen stroke down. Uh, I have that stuff up so that you can see where this, uh, this math that we're about to derive comes from. But I'd, I would like to kind of go through this so that it's not something that we just trust and, and believe that magically somehow this works. All right? So we're going to get into this. The, the first thing that we should do is probably describe this failure criteria similarly to how we described our maximum shear stress failure criteria before. And so this is a statement of it here. Yielding will occur when the distortion strain energy per unit volume reaches or exceeds the distortion strain energy per unit volume for yield in simple tension or compression of the same material. Okay, so again, there's kind of a lot packed in there. We have to define a couple of things. So as of yet in this course, we have defined uh, the idea of strain energy and strain energy density. But what we need to do now is uh, figure out what we mean by this idea of distortion strain energy. Okay? The basic idea here is that uh, experiments have shown that uh, materials are not really likely to fail if all you apply to them is just what's called a hydrostatic pressure. Okay? The idea behind this, or, or one way of thinking about this, is if you were somehow to take a piece of material and throw it in a bath of, let's say, hydraulic fluid or something and create extreme pressures on that piece of material, it would actually pretty much never yield. Okay? It, you can put as much pressure on it as you want and it does not yield. Uh, and this is an interesting thing. You know, this is, this is kind of the basis of what we're talking about here. It's not just that hydrostatic pressure that would cause something to fail. It is the idea of causing a piece of material to actually change shape, to distort. And that is the, the key factor that tends to make things deform permanently or yield, fail. Okay? So what we need to do now is talk about what do we mean by distortion energy. Okay? And uh, you know, so what we're going to do is we're going to break that down into the idea that we can have a uh, total amount of strain and it is equal to an amount of strain that essentially leads only to a change of volume of the material. And this is something that most of us probably don't think about very much, is that strains actually can change the amount of volume that a piece of material occupies. All right? Volume is not, uh, is not constant. If you strain a piece of material, the volume of that piece of material can actually change. And what we're splitting here is strain that causes a pure volume change. We're splitting that away from the amount of strain that essentially causes a pure distortion of shape. All right? So these are the two types of strain. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and assert this without proof. Uh, it can be proven. It takes a little bit more than what we're going to get into today. But I'm going to assert that the, uh, the component of stress that causes a pure volume change is just the amount of the average amount of stress between your three normal components on a stress element. So if you average those three elements of normal stress, then what comes out of that is your uh, essentially this average stress, and that is the piece of stress that causes just a pure volume change. Okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to take that average between your three normal components of stress and plug it in everywhere where we have one of our normal stresses in our strain energy density formula that we had derived uh, prior to today. So this is the same formula we had before for strain energy density. We're going to plug in this average stress into each of these uh, principal stresses that we had in that strain energy density formula. I, I showed a few arrows there. 
I probably should show some more that you're, we're also plugging it into all of these, you know, every single place where we have one of these uh, principal stresses, we're gonna plug this in, okay? And, uh, you know, Dr. Lee was my mechanics and materials professor and he used to actually have this phrase, he said, after many dot, all right? So there's a few dots here from that step down to coming up with what the hydrostatic strain energy density is. So we're essentially uh, chasing through the algebra of plugging that average of sigma one plus sigma two plus sigma three over three, plugging that in to each of those stress values. Um, it can boil down into this three times this uh, average stress squared over two E multiplied by one minus two times the Poisson's ratio. Okay, and you can verify that if you'd like, but that's just algebra from that uh, between those two steps. All right. Well, what is that average? So this is sort of a sidebar. We, we now we've defined what this uh, average, uh, what, what this average stress is. Yes, sir. Thank you. I put in a few Easter eggs for you to find, you know, that way I know who's awake. So yeah, thank you. Um, so what we're going to do here is we, to, to actually plug in this uh, average stress value, it actually takes us squaring um, this, this quantity of sigma 1 plus sigma 2 plus sigma 3 over 3. We've got to square that. And to do that, it basically takes um, a lot of a big old algebraic expansion there, which I have done. Okay. <clears throat> and I'm going to take that and essentially plug it back in to that location for my hydrostatic strain energy density. And what comes out is this expression, one minus two times the Poisson's ratio over six times the um, elastic modulus, all of that multiplied by the, you know, all of those principal stresses that you see there. I won't try to repeat them all verbally, okay? So that's my hydrostatic strain energy density. If I want to know what my distortion strain energy density is, I essentially look at how much total strain energy density I have and subtract off the hydrostatic strain energy density. Okay, so the, the idea there is that the sum of the hydrostatic and distortion strain energy densities equals the total amount of strain energy density. So I'm just going to look at um, you know, that equation rearranged to figure out what the distortion strain energy density is. Okay, and so what we see there is the, the top uh, up here, the top expression is the total strain energy density. Again, that's the formula that we derived earlier in the course. Okay, and what we have here down underneath that is just the hydrostatic portion. And actually, I tell you what, I'm going to change the, the color on that because I would like to help you try to chase through um, you know, how these show up down here. <coughs> Excuse me. So to actually make that uh, difference right there, to, to take the difference between those two values, what I'm essentially doing all in one step is I am distributing through, uh, you know, my 1 over 2e, for instance, or my 1 minus 2 nu over 6e. Okay, I'm distributing those through these uh, expressions. And so what you see here is that the very first part up here comes from my uh, total strain energy density. And these other two parts, you know, this part right here comes from the one in the numerator of the one minus two nu over six E. See that? And then the next part comes from the two times nu. Okay. And so essentially what I'm doing there is I'm dealing with all of my stress components squared. So my principal stress components squared, I'm, I'm putting all of those, kind of collecting all of those together. Okay. And, uh, you know, in blue right below that, I have sort of simplified that down and actually done the, uh, the addition and subtraction to get that taken care of. All right. And then in the next part, um, I'm dealing with all of my products of my principal stresses in a very similar way, okay?
And you can see there in the blue underneath there, I have simplified uh, all of those by getting a common denominator and going ahead and doing those additions and subtractions. Okay, all this is just algebra, right? The, the starting point, kind of understanding that we're doing these different types of strain energy, I, I considered that to be more important uh, to understand, and then the rest of it is just chasing algebra through. Okay, so what we end up with here, if I actually take those two expressions and, uh, and add them together properly, my distortion strain energy density, I have an expression that gives that to me in terms of my principal stress components, as well as a couple of elastic parameters, my elastic modulus and Poisson's ratio for the material. Okay, so that is, you know, this is where we start. We say here is an expression for just the distortion strain energy density. Now we need to go back up and probably take a, another peek at what the actual uh, energy failure theory, the distortion energy failure theory says. It says when that distortion strain energy per unit volume, which is what we just found, that's what the density part of it is, when that reaches or exceeds the distortion strain energy per unit volume for at the point of yield for a tensile specimen, that's when we can expect that a piece of material will fail uh, if it's actually in service with multiple stress components. Okay, like multiple, it can have uh, principal stresses in all the principal directions and, uh, and we can still predict with data just out of a pure tensile test, we can still predict when it's going to fail. All right, so let's evaluate that. Um, the amount of stress, or the, the type of stress, I really should say, uh, that exists in a tensile specimen is a uniaxial state of stress. What that means is that it has one principal stress that is non-zero, and then the other two components of principal stress are zero. All right, so that's what I have uh, right here is that I have my first principal stress there. Uh, at the point where the material yields, that is this yielding strength that they call capital S sub Y in this textbook. Okay, my other two components are zero. If I plug all of those into my distortion strain energy density formula up here, it boils down to uh, one plus Poisson's ratio over three times the elastic modulus times that yielding strength squared. Okay, so what I'm saying here is that we can expect that there will be a failure at the point where my distortion strain energy density for a general case reaches the distortion strain energy that I have at yield for a uh, tensile specimen. So I'm basically going to take these two expressions and set them equal to each other. All right. And when I do that, all of those elastic constants that I have for the material cancel out. See that? That entire part at the beginning cancels out. And I'm left with that the square of the yielding strength is equal to just the portion of this uh, expression that has the principal stresses in it. Okay. And so what this gives rise to is a safe condition. Okay. The safe condition is the one where our uh, amount of stress that is actually being experienced in a generally loaded piece of material is less uh, than the yielding strength. All right. And this actually gives rise to another parameter that we use uh, quite a bit in, uh, in engineering. As a matter of fact, uh, you, most of you probably just turned in a project where you had to do some finite element modeling on a, on a part and you had to evaluate von Mises stress. Did anyone do that? <laughs> Yeah, not as many of you as maybe should have, but you know, a good number of you probably did that. Um, what von Mises stress is, it is a, a single number that is valid to compare against yielding strength, but it evaluates and kind of encapsulates all the different components of stress that might exist on an actual element of material. So it, it really does give you a number that you can compare against a yielding strength value and it would be a valid way to, to know whether or not you're close to the material failing. Okay, and so that's you know the the uh, formula or the the uh, variable that they assign to that in the book is this sigma prime. Uh, 
That is von Mises stress. All right, and it is just the square root of the difference between each of your principal stress components squared, all of that over two. Okay. One of the things I love about these is that you can generally tell whether or not you got the right result if you see symmetry, mathematical symmetry, right? Are any of the principal stresses any different than any of the other ones in terms of the math? And the answer is no. The reason why is that it doesn't matter which direction you do any one of these differences because every one of them squared, right? So the, the sign of each of those ends up you know, not really mattering because of the square term for each one of them. And so we have the difference between 1 and 2, the difference between 2 and 3, and the difference between 1 and 3. Right? So every single possibility is accounted for, and they're all squared. And it's significant that they are differences, too, because you are going to end up with a, uh, you know, a more severe stress state if you have large differences between principal stresses. Right? Remember, if all your principal stresses have the same value, that is hydrostatic stress, and that does not tend to lead to failure of material. It's generally when it distorts that you're going to have, you're going to be more likely to, to be failing your material. Okay? Questions here at this point? Yes, sir. Correct. Yeah, the, the easiest one to, to mentally evaluate is when you, because I think you're probably referring to the example I gave of if you throw something in a bath of liquid and you put a really high pressure on it and it doesn't tend to fail. Um, that's the easier one to actually realize in real life. Uh, you know, it's a fairly easy experiment to do, for instance. It's a harder experiment to try to put a tensile stress in all directions on a piece of material. But uh, the theory goes that you know, it really, that doesn't create this, the, uh, you know, type of situation that would tend to fail the material. That's a good question. All right. So now I'm going to show you another couple of, uh, another couple of expressions of this same idea. Um, let's look at the situation where we have plain stress. If you have plain stress, what happens? Okay. When you have plane stress, you end up not having one of your three uh, components. You only have two principal stress components. All right. And if you just have two principal stress components, uh, then what you have here is that this expression, this full expression for von Mises stress, boils down to uh, the expression we have here. And so the, the very first sigma 1 minus sigma 2 squared is in the parentheses here. And then in the other two cases, sigma 3 is 0, and so you just end up with a sigma 2 and a sigma 1. All right. And if we follow that through and simplify it down, then our expression for plane stress is, uh, is this one here that is essentially, you know, it's an interesting expression. Again, the symmetry of it is interesting, right? It doesn't matter whether you have A versus B, right? Um, and what that expression gives us is an ellipse, all right? And the ellipse that it gives us is interesting, OK? I'll tell you what, I'm going to erase some of this stuff real quick. The ellipse it gives us circumscribes the Tresca hexagon that we had, that we looked at last time, all right? which is pretty cool. What that means is that if we have a few interesting states of stress, that is, if we have uh, a state of plane stress where we have um, the two components being equal to each other, right? that would be up here at this point or down here at this point. The Tresca criterion predicts exactly the same uh, you know, tendency to fail as the distortion energy criteria. Okay. It does that at a few other places, right? Each of these points right here. So if you just have uniaxial states of stress, right? It, it predicts the same exact thing whether you're looking at the maximum shear stress criteria or at the distortion energy criteria. So that's kind of another interesting uh, outcome. All right. Um, 
What we'll notice here is that for the state of pure shear, the state of pure shear uh, is, is interesting because we would not actually predict the same shearing strength out of the material using distortion energy as we do with uh, the maximum shear stress theory. And here's how we know that. If we look along this line of pure shear, okay, a load that, that intersects the Tresca criterion, uh, it, it's a shorter load line than if we have another one that goes all the way out to the, uh, the ellipse that I have drawn out there. Okay? So let's figure out what is a good expression for the, uh, you know, how to find a shearing strength um, if we know a normal strength, a normal yielding strength. How do we find a shearing yielding strength using the distortion energy criteria? Okay. <clears throat> so toward that end, what I'm going to do here is um, that case where we have pure shear is the one where one of our normal stresses is the negative of the other one, or the, one of our principal stresses is the negative of the other one. And, you know, I'll, I'll prove that again here with more circle, okay, more circle down here. If we have a state of pure shear, okay, we would have just those two points at the top and bottom of that circle, which means that our two in-plane principal stresses are negatives of one another. So I plug those in up here, and if I chase that through, um, what it allows us to see is that our yielding strength, okay, which I can call maybe tau sub y here, that yielding strength is going to be 0.577 or, uh, or 0.577 times the normal uh, yielding strength for the material. Um, and that comes from essentially the normal yielding strength over the square root of three. So that's kind of an interesting result. And actually, this is one that we use quite often. All right? As a matter of fact, in a lot of your uh, problems from here on out, uh, it may even tell you that uh, you should use the distortion energy criteria to estimate a yielding or a shearing yielding strength uh, if all you have is a normal yielding strength. And when you do that, the, you interpret that to say, yep, okay, I need to take 0.577 times my uh, yielding strength in a normal orientation. All right? Pretty slick. I have one other topic here, one other idea that I want to throw at you uh, because it, it kind of relates. Yes, Marshall. Um, so how do we know when to use that criteria versus last time I talked about how I Generally, the problems that I give you will be, will be explicit about that and say, I want you to use distortion energy criteria or Tresca criteria. Um, and it won't require necessarily that you do thinking to figure out which one would be more appropriate. I'll say this, that uh, often the Tresca criteria has simpler math often, not always, but often it has simpler math. Um, it has these uh, locations around the perimeter where the slope is discontinuous, uh, at the Tresca criteria. So if you're doing some, you know, certain types of automated work, sometimes that's actually a problem for you. If you have these discontinuous, it means you have to put logic into computer code or that kind of thing so that you, you know, pick the correct portion of the, uh, of the perimeter of that hexagon, right? as opposed to the uh, von Mises cr criterion, which is more smooth around the perimeter. Not as much logic is needed, right? So there's, there's some advantages here and there uh, in real life. But as far as y'all are concerned, uh, actually most of the problems that I'm going to have you do, I'm going to have you do both ways so that you see what is it like with Tresca, what is it like with distortion energy, OK? All right. This is the next thing I wanted to talk about is, and this to me helps to kind of connect uh, the shearing stress theory that we learned last time with distortion energy criteria. So it's called the octahedral shear stress criteria. And the idea with the octahedral shear stress idea, and you know, I don't have it stated up here because it's not one we're going to explicitly directly use, but the idea is that if you draw inside of a stress cube, you draw this thing that's called an octahedron, okay? It's basically two pyramids 
uh, stacked on top of each other. Okay. If you draw a, a, uh, an element like that inside of a stress cube, and then you do all the stress transformations that you need to to figure out the shearing stress that occurs on the faces of that octahedron. Okay, that's kind of what I have drawn right here. You can have normal stress and you can have shearing stress on all the faces of that octahedron. Right? Um, the, the theory basically goes that your, uh, a part will fail, a part that has a general loading on it will fail whenever this octahedral shearing stress reaches the amount of octahedral shearing stress you have in a tensile specimen when it fails. Okay, so, you know, what's kind of interesting, though, about this idea is that if you chase through all of the math of the octahedral, octahedral shear stress concept, it gives you exactly the same thing as distortion energy criteria. Like, literally, your, your conclusions are exactly the same. You come up with von Mises stress, all right? Which is really cool. So what this does is, it, to me anyway, it, it kind of illustrates what was wrong with, um, with our shearing stress, our maximum shearing stress theory. And actually, that's something I, I should pull out at this point is to talk about that a little bit. Um, if you look on page 245, there's a figure that essentially puts uh, the Tresca criteria along with the distortion energy criteria together on the same set of axes along with experimental data. It says we've loaded different materials to different levels of stress. And what you see there is that the cluster of the data basically is all clustered around uh, the distortion energy criteria uh, threshold. Okay? What that tells us is that distortion energy is probably a better criteria. It, it more closely represents what really happens in materials than maximum shear stress. Okay? What's interesting, though, is that the uh, Tresca hexagon that's inside of there is more conservative. Right? It means that uh, you are not likely to have a failure prior to you predicting a failure, right? Because you basically are putting the threshold further to the inside of where it is more likely to actually occur, okay? So for this reason, generally the maximum shear stress slash um, Tresca criteria is thought of as a conservative failure criteria, whereas the distortion energy criteria is not, meaning that with distortion energy, uh, you could actually uh, have something, there's not many of these points, but there's a few of them where you could have a failure prior to your prediction that it might fail. And that's generally a bad thing, right? If, if you see, you know, a, a case where a part will fail prior to when you would have predicted it would, uh, or at lower stress levels than you would have predicted it would, that's probably not good. So we're usually about conservatism. Um, but one of the ways that we can achieve conservatism um, is, uh, is with something else. It's called a factor of safety, which we're going to deal with a little bit more in just a minute. All right. Here's a couple of other, other expressions for, uh, for von Mises stress that are also in your book. Um, I am, I'm not going to derive these, but I figured I'd throw them up here anyway. Um, what are these good for? Okay, so... Uh, if you have a general XYZ state of stress, so you basically have all your different components, normal stresses in X, Y, and Z, as well as shearing stresses in all of your different planes, uh, finding your uh, von Mises stress is not actually that bad. All you got to do is plug in all of those components into this upper equation and uh, calculate. Okay. If you have a state of plane stress, so this is another special case. If you have a state of plane stress, but you have not yet found the principal stresses using something like Moore's circle, you don't necessarily have to use Moore's circle if all you're going for is, the, is finding von Mises stress. Okay? All you got to do is use this expression right here. Okay? Sound good? All right. Should we do an example? 
Yeah. I'll be doing one one way or the other. Um, you know, you guys can, can follow along if that's something that you desire. Okay. Here's our problem. Oh, and I forgot I was going to mention this down here. I'm sorry. One, one other comment real quick. It, the, the shape of that ellipse that we talked about just a second ago might seem a little bit odd to you all. Why is there this ellipse that's canted over at some position? Why is there even, the, the hexagon might be similar. Why is there this hexagon that's kind of looks like it's skewed? All right, the reason for that is what we're doing is we're looking at a slice of a three-dimensional shape that's a little bit more complicated, okay? So what I'm showing you here is that we can express um, we can express these failure criteria in more three-dimensional terms. But what we end up with is basically, if you, if you plot principal stresses, so the idea here is that you have now determined principal stresses on a square or on a cube, which means that there are no shearing stresses. So let's say you've determined those and you've got it oriented such that that's, these are your principal directions. Um, and then you essentially plot where do you expect failure relative to those principal directions, okay? What you actually have is a circular tube. This is for the distortion energy criteria. You have a circular tube that extends along an axis that is essentially pointing straight at us, okay? Relative to how that set of axes, so imagine there's a, there's a line that is essentially impossible for me to draw because it's pointing straight at us, okay? And then there is a circular tube. That's what this red thing is. This is our distortion energy. Criterion, okay? And imagine it pointing straight out along this uh, axis that's sort of equally spaced between all of my principal directions, it's pointing straight out at us, right? And if we deviate outside of there, we predict failure. As long as we stay in that tube, as long, you know, you can go to whatever stress level you want, tension or compression, and uh, you don't, you won't predict failure, okay? And you also see that I've, I've put the hexagon in there as well. That's the Tresca hexagon. You know, it's not a circular tube, it's a hexagonally, um, shaped tube that points straight out us along the same axis. And that would be the, uh, the three-dimensional equivalent uh, for, for the maximum shear stress theory. Isn't that pretty cool? I think so. You're welcome to disagree. All right. Tell you what, I want to move all this stuff aside. So we can get into our actual example problem. Oops. All right. More three D structures. Aren't you happy? I see all those smiles. All right. This is a. Uh, you know, I'll call it Z-shaped. I guess it's not an actual Z, but it's a, you know, it's a rod that's bent at two 90-degree angles. All right, it's then set up across these two supports, one at A and one at B, or excuse me, one at E. And then it's loaded right in the middle of the whole thing with 300 newtons pointing straight down. Okay. And so, you know, I've, I've kind of intentionally um, sort of implied here that the rod is just resting on top of a couple of supports. The way I would interpret that in terms of an actual reaction is that there will not be a significant amount of lateral reaction between these parts. We'll essentially ignore that there could be friction between them, um, or we'll say that it's a negligible amount of reaction that will happen that direction since we're not loading it in any lateral direction. There's no loads that would make it want to slide in one of those directions. We'll just say that it's going to stay here because it's, it won't have any loads in that direction. Okay. What we want to do is we want to come up with, 
Factors of safety. Okay, we want to come up with a factor of safety. And I'll say a factor of safety against yielding, right? Using the distortion energy criteria. And uh, we will, in here, we'll begin to start um, abbreviating that with DE, all right, distortion energy uh, criterion, as well as we'll go back and we'll do one with MSS as well, maximum shear stress. Okay, the other thing that I want to do is I want to plot. Uh, the uh, failure loci, lo loci, I don't know exactly uh, which the correct pronunciation is of that. For distortion energy and our maximum shear stress criteria. And I want to plot the load line. Okay, so that's what we're trying to do. In the interest of uh, trying to conserve time here, because we, we do want to finish this before we run out of time in our class period here together, uh, let me go ahead and take the opportunity right at the beginning and come up with the material property that matters to us for uh, this type of material. It's a normalized 1095 steel. And I went ahead and wrote up here where you can find those properties in the textbook, the properties for that type of material. Okay, so 1095 in a normalized state, um, and I'm going to do this problem. It, it's all in uh, in SI units there, as far as the dimensions and loads and everything. So I'll I'll come up with the uh, a, an SI units expression of the strength of this material. It says that it is 500 megapascals in that table. Okay, so 500 megapascals. We'll need that, you know, not right away, but we'll, we'll have it there so we don't have to look it up again. All right. What's our first step? Yeah, we should probably do some free body diagrams, right? I tell you what, in the interest of time, you know, even though we could do a free body diagram and figure out what the external reactions should be for a, a body like this, symmetry is often your friend, right? And I didn't want to spend all my time doing a really complicated free body diagram problem. And so what do these uh, supports imply? Yeah, they'll probably share the load equally. And you can tell that, uh, so I'm going to erase them and just show a, uh, you know, a reaction at each of these locations, one here and one here. Oops. All right. And what are the values going to be for those reactions? Hundred and fifty newtons each. Awesome but we might have to do some other free body diagrams as well, okay? One of the things that we need to determine is where do we think the critical location is for this part? Anyone have uh, any suggestions? Okay, I've had someone, someone just suggested point C. Anyone agree with them? Raise your hand. Good deal. Anyone disagree? <laughs> I don't think you're telling the truth. I agree. Point C is most likely to be the point where we're going to have our critical location. Okay? Um, so we're going to look at uh, specifically at that point. We need to find the stresses at that point. 
Let's actually be even more precise as well. Where specifically at point C do we expect to have the worst problem? Okay, top and bottom is where we're most likely to find a patch of material that is experiencing really where the worst stress is. Okay, um, and so between those two, which would you rather deal with? Between top and bottom? Because bottom probably, and the reason we say at the bottom is that it's going to have tensile, tensile uh, normal stress due to flexure on the bottom side. See how it's going to tend to flex up? So that's where we're really focusing in. It's a patch of material on the bottom side of the rod at point C. There's kind of right under here, there's a little patch of material down there, and that's the one we're going to focus on. Okay. All right. So how do we figure out the stresses that exist in that little patch of material? Well, I'll tell you what. Let me actually make a couple of cuts in this body. I'm going to basically slice off AB over here and slice off uh, DE over here. And let's look at just rod BCD. Okay, and I, I can even zoom in on it a little bit if that helps us to think about it. So there's just, I've, I've basically made cuts uh, in the two ends, and I'm just extracting just member uh, BCD, or just that much of the overall member. Okay. And on that, we have this 300 Newton force still that's hap happening in the middle. What other uh, loads happen on this part? Okay. To answer that question, let's think about what happens on the little extensions. And I'll do just, I guess I'll just do one of them. I'll do the part that goes from D to E. Okay. There's this other piece that extends from D to E. Okay. And I have this 150 Newton reaction that happens at the end of that. And I know that just that, that piece from D to E has to be in equilibrium. How is it in equilibrium? Okay. It better have a reaction against that 150 Newton force, you know, and the only place it can have that reaction is at the point where we made the cut, right? So I better have 150 Newton force acting this direction to counteract my 150 Newton force at the other end, but is that enough? It is not, because the way it stands right now, it would rotate. If that's the only two forces that acted on it, it couldn't be in equilibrium rotationally. So the only way it can be in equilibrium ro rotationally is if we also have a moment that's applied at D. And that moment had better be applied such that it tends to rotate it, uh, you know, clockwise, we'll say. What, would, what most of us would perceive to be clockwise the way we're looking at it. Right? And that, once we put these things on there, it can be in equilibrium. Well, how much, you know, how much of a moment do we need there at D? Okay, well, we know that this length right here, right, is what? 30 centimeters. Okay, so I have 150 newtons times 30 centimeters. That gives me 4,500 Newton centimeters, okay? <clears throat> so if those are the forces that act at D for member DE, or, or the portion DE, then what would act at D for portion BCD. 
Equal and opposite, right? So equal values, but opposite directions. All right, so that means that we would have an upward force acting at D of 150 newtons. Okay, and I would have an opposite direction of rotational influence uh, moment that acted at D as well. And that would be around the same axis, which that axis would be something like this. And that moment would be acting this way. So that's 4,500 Newton centimeters. Now I could do all of that again if I wanted to over at point B, but it's essentially the same exercise, right? It would be the same, uh, you know, steps that we would do. And so rather than do it all again, I'll put 150 newtons and 4,500 newton centimeters. All right. Does that get us any further? Yes, sir. No, both of those would, would act upward because, again, um, if, if we looked at member AB, it would have to have a downward force on member AB. So that would mean you'd have an upward force on BCD. So both would be upward. All right. So the next step is to figure out what effect do these loads have on that little patch of material that we care about. And again, we can't even see the patch of material because it's up under this body right up under there. Okay, it's a little element or patch is under there. What are the two loads it experiences? There's really only two that we have to count for in this problem. Bending and torsion. So we have a normal stress due to bending and we have a shearing stress due to torsion. Okay, so let's figure those out. Okay. Um, we'll start with bending. What's our easiest way to come up with our uh, bending stress at the patch? Okay, in my estimation, it is imagining making a cut right here at this location and figuring out what kind of a moment would I need at that location uh, to react against my 150 Newton force that I have at, at end D, for instance. Okay, so what would that moment be? Okay, 150 newtons times 10 centimeters. Okay, and what I'm doing here is a, a formula MC over I. That's, that's what I'm building here is uh, stress is equal to MC over I. 150 newtons times 10 centimeters gives me M. C is what? Okay, we go up to the top up here. The diameter of the rod is 10 millimeters. Okay, so C is the radius of the rod, right? Because it's how far are you from the neutral axis to the outer fibers of the beam. Uh, and that would be half of the diameter or would just be the radius. So 10 millimeters over 2. And what's a formula for I for a solid circular cross section? Pi over 64 times the diameter to the fourth. Okay. Quick question How many millimeters is 10 centimeters? It's 100, right? 
A centimeter is a hundredth of a meter, and a millimeter is a thousandth of a meter, so it's only a factor of 10 between the two, so it's 100 millimeters. I'm going to just go ahead and change this to 100 millimeters. Why do you think I'm doing that? Okay. Well, what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm changing to just newtons and millimeters. And one of the things I want to show you here is, a, is kind of a little trick. Um, if you end up with newtons per square millimeter, okay, if you think about a square millimeter, a millimeter is a thousandth of a meter. So you're basically squaring a factor of a thousandth. Okay, and a thousandth is essentially times 10 to the negative 3. Right? You're squaring that. So you end up with 10 times, or times 10 to the negative 6. Right? And that's in the denominator. So if you put it in the numerator, it would be times 10 to the positive 6. And what would that be? Mega. Right? So this is a really slick thing that happens with a particular set of units in the SI system, where if you have newtons per square millimeter, you don't really necessarily have to deal with any of the units you'll know that that's going to come out in megapascals. Okay, so let's go ahead and, and punch all this in. So we have 150 times 100 times 10 divided by 2 times pi times 10 to the fourth. And I tell you what, I'm going to come back around to the front and multiply by 64. Oops. Did I? Uh, I think I put the two. I believe this is right. I put the two there. I just put it in the denominator. Okay, so 152.79 megapascals. Okay, what about torsion? Tc over J. Okay, so what do we have here? All right, we have 4,500 Newton centimeters. What would that be in Newton millimeters? 45,000 Newton millimeters. Okay. Then what? Again, C is the radius. Okay, and this is our, our tau. C is the radius. And then what's J? What's that? Okay. So let's punch those in. 45,000 uh, times 10 times 32 divided by pi times 2 times 10 to the fourth. Oops. Two hundred twenty nine point one eight megapascals.
Okay. What are we trying to look for here? Factor of safety using distortion energy criteria and the MSS criteria. Okay. So for the MSS criteria, we're going to need principal stresses, right? All right, so what we need to think about here is what is our state of stress really? Let me draw a quick more circle. Okay. One of our principal stresses, our in-plane principal stresses is zero. What's our other in-plane principal stress? Or not principal stress, our in I shouldn't say principal stress for one of these. One of my in-plane uh, stresses is zero, right? Because I don't have any hoop stress, right? My other in-plane stress that I have here, not principal stress yet, that's what we're looking for. The other in-plane stress I have is my 152.79. Okay. And I don't actually care for this problem, what direction I put my shears. It's gonna, that's going to bother some of you, but I don't really care for this. It doesn't matter what direction I put my shears. Okay? But I need to plot my shear. I shear do. That's right, Marshall. All right, so where do I plot my shear? Okay, I plot it like up here maybe, and down here, and the height that I plotted at is going to be 229.18 MPA, All right? That's how you get up to this height, okay? And it's those, that line right there is kind of a descriptor of the state of stress that I'm in. Again, this, is, this direction is normal stress. This direction is shearing stress on more circle. How do I figure out what my uh, principal stresses are? Well, the geometry of it says I rotate from here around to these two points. And wherever this, you know, you kind of pivot around that middle point. And that gives you these uh, principal stresses. All right. This is a good, you know, many of you probably don't want to memorize the equations that we have that are associated with Mohr's circle. I don't either, which is why I generally think about what Mohr's circle looks like. And what this basically tells me here is that, the, you know, the first thing we have to do is establish where is this middle point. That middle point is just the average between zero and my stress value that I got from flexure, okay? So really this is just, you know, to find my A and B, it's going to be equal to 152.8 MPA over two, plus and minus the square root of, okay? Because now what we are doing is we're coming up with what is the radius of this circle the radius of the circle is half of the difference between, uh, you know, 152.8 and zero for one leg of the triangle. Okay, so again, that gives me 152.8 MPA over two. That will be squared because it's only one leg of the triangle. Again, the triangle that I'm referring to is like a triangle like this. Plus, the other leg of the triangle is the shear that I have. So I have over there 229.18 MPA. And those are my in-plane principal stresses. Okay.
well, how do I figure out my uh, factor of safety? All right. Well, I'll tell you what. We're, we're approaching rapidly. I have about five minutes left in class. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pop over to a MathCAD sheet, and you can see the remainder. The rest of it's pretty easy. But all you have to do, uh, I'll, I'll kind of describe it before I go to the MathCAD sheet. A factor of safety, the definition of it is the amount of stress that causes failure. divided by the amount of stress applied. So for us, what do we need to do to do the distortion energy criteria? What do you put in the numerator? S sub y, and you put in the denominator? von Mises stress, and that gives you factor of safety, okay? So here's my MathCAD sheet. And I'm going to open up this little section right here, okay? You see there, now I'm starting to, da oh no, I guess it turns out good, yeah. <laughs> For a second there, I thought my numbers were off from the ones I calculated a second ago. Looks like they're right. Okay, um, I've got my principal stresses A and B. You'll see there I've got two different ways that I'm evaluating my von Mises stress. One is if you already have your principal stresses, sigma A and sigma B, okay, you can use this expression where it's the square root of the first one squared minus the product of the two plus the second one squared, right? And that gives you your von Mises stress. The other thing you can do is use the expression. Um, I don't have it looked up in my book right now, but I, I gave it in this uh, presentation right up here. You have plain stress. If you don't want to go through the trouble of finding your principal stresses, right, all you got to do is take... Uh, the components of stress that you have relative to your XY system and just plug them right in. And so that's what I did here. You'll notice that I only have one normal stress, so the other normal stress component is not represented there. And both of those expressions for von Mises stress end up the same. That gives us a little bit of confidence, hopefully. All right. And then my factor of safety is just the yielding strength that I had, which is 500 megapascals, divided by the uh, von Mises stress that I calculated. Okay. And you'll see here that the factor of safety turns out to be 1.176 for the distortion energy criteria. For the maximum shear stress criteria, what you do is it, it basically depends on what's the difference between A and B. Now, this is only true if you're in this fourth quadrant, right? So be careful of that. It, that's one of the tricky things about using the maximum shear stress criteria is you have different formulas depending on which values are greater than other ones. So if you have both are tension, for instance, you're going to end up looking at whichever component is larger tension, and that one's going to be the one that controls. That's when you're up in this portion of the uh, failure locus. Okay, And what I want to show you here, this is kind of the last thing I want to show you, is um, I want to show you really the significance of the load line. I tried to talk about this when we met last time, but it's a lot easier to show you live on a sheet like this that's, that's updating uh, in a live fashion. Okay, Watch what happens here if I cut the amount of load that I apply in half. Okay, so I'm going to put on instead of uh, 300 newtons, I'm going to put on 150 newtons. Okay, 
What happened to the load line? Okay, it shrunk. It actually is half the length that it was before. But it's going along the same slope that it did before. And so this gives us a graphical way of thinking about, you know, how close are we to failure, right? As a matter of fact, if I was to draw a line that extended from zero out to one of these failure criteria, the percentage of that line that my load line covers is, well, it's the inverse of it, right? But the inverse of it is my, uh, my factor of safety. In other words, if I was to cover all of it, then that's 100%, you know, and, and my factor of safety is 1. If I'm only at 50%, uh, then what would my factor of safety be? 2, right? Or if we wanted to change here to something even bigger, let's say we wanted to put this at uh, like 450, okay? What you'll see happen there is that my factors of safety are now less than 1, meaning that I would predict failure. I would predict yield for those cases, okay? But, you know, by changing that one load, which is the only one I have on this system, um, it basically keeps that load line to where it's at the same slope and it just changes the length depending on how much load I put on it. All right? Sweet.